appreciate your presence. Um, I teach anthropology. Uh, oops. Okay. So um, I want to start out by saying that uh, I teach anthropology. I'm an anthropologist, and I focus on legal anthropology, in particular how uh, communities in many different cultures share resources or govern the resources that they share. And um, so uh, I, I wrote out the talk so that I could try to really stay within the 20, 25 minutes. So please, I'm sorry, I, I may uh, read every now and then. But I just want to start out by saying I'm going to um, answer this question, why do we need community solar? Um, not as a policy analyst, an economist, or an engineer, but as an anthropologist. So in that sense, I'm going to be focusing on how technology and shared resources are embedded in value systems, in particular the culture of a community. So, um, I'm going to start by giving you an example. This is a project, a solar electrification project in, in Brazil that was very, uh, very well uh, received and very successful. Um, the social entrepreneur uh, Fabio Rosa had this idea to deliver electricity to areas of the rural countryside that had never been electrified. He figured out how to offer the poor rural households a PV panel storage battery and an outlet system that could, they could rent for the same amount of money that they were paying for candles and gasoline. So um, electricity in the area had lots of benefits. You can imagine you could plug in a radio or a cell phone and be connected to neighbors. You could plug in a sewing machine to start a small business in the community. Uh, there were many opportunities for diverse kinds of community wealth with these solar panels. And the business plan appeared to work great, except for one thing. The renters were not taking proper care of the technology. And there were too many preventable repairs for the business model to work. Not until uh, Mr. Robios um, started to include this little saint statue along with the batteries that people developed a caring relationship to the technology. In this area, Brazil is Catholic, so households understood how to incorporate the new technology into their value system. So that's the kind of question that I want to ask about solar energy in the United States. What value systems, what cultural assumptions are in the emergent field of solar technology and its deployment? How is that embedded and how is its embeddedness in these value systems determining the wealth of opportunities that solar energy presents to us at this historical moment in the United States? The Brazilian solar initiative is called the Sun Shines for All. And in order to really include everyone in the benefits of solar energy, Fabio Rosa had to understand how solar technology fit into the broader cultural system it was embedded in. He had to make visible a value system people believed in. And, and that's what I want to address for solar energy in this talk today. So these are my three points. Why do we need community solar? I'm going to basically be arguing that we need community solar, solar to have democratic access to economic benefits. Um, it's a tool to create greater social equity. And finally, with it, we can make public a new relationship to the earth. The potential to make visible in the public domain the value system of a society that's learning how to live in balance with the earth. Okay. So to make my argument, I'm going to focus on the community solar project that I've been working on for the last six years. It's called the Solar Commons. It's a, a model for community solar that's placed in public domains, city parks, rights of way, and such. And it uses public art to make visible the place of energy production 
in the new ecological value system of the earth. This was one of the first designs by an architect I was working with. We had the idea that you would uh, bend the technology of the solar panels to fit nature as a kind of as a symbolic um, gesture. But the real uh, contribution of the solar commons is its ownership model. It owns the photovoltaic system as a community trust. And it makes low-income neighborhoods the beneficiary, the beneficial owner, of the income stream that it creates through electricity sales. So for example, a donation of about 75,000, I'm talking, these are, the, these are the numbers that we have figured out in, in Arizona where I've been working, um, could build a solar commons that would bring um, in a park right away, would bring, it, bring in an income stream of about 5,000 or more a year for the 25 year period of the electricity sale contract. So in addition to selling green energy at a stable price at or below the price of dirty energy, the solar commons would be able to use the common wealth captured in the income stream to support a long-term project in the community with this $5,000. It could have an urban garden, it could have a shaded outdoor meeting place, a community building festival, um, various things. And these, these kinds of things are always determined in the community, in the neighborhood that we work with. Um, I want to note too that the Solar Commons was awarded the U.S. Green Building Council's Legacy Prize for 2009. Um, the Solar Commons model uses the principles of commons design proposed by Eleanor Ostrom, the 2009 Nobel Prize Laureate in Economics for her work on commons governance of shared resources. Now I'll say more about um, the principles of trust ownership uh, shortly, but first I'm going to talk about something else. So I, I imagine that um, many of you are familiar with these figures, but um, I just I'm going to begin by considering why our current energy ownership system is insufficient to deliver all the benefits of solar energy. Why do communities need to get involved? And why at a smaller distributed scale? Um, we know that we urgently need to move away from fossil fuel and transition to clean energy. Um, this is the kind of do the math uh, tour of, uh, of Bill McKibben. Um, it's hard to believe that without enormous social pressure, given, you know, given these numbers, I'll talk about it in a minute, that the current energy ownership model will willingly move to solar and that it will allow smaller scale solar players like communities onto the electric grids that are controlled by the bigger players. So again, this, if you're familiar with this, just very quickly, two degrees Celsius, that's the target accepted in 2009 by the Copenhagen Climate Accord as the mean global temperature rise below which the most dangerous effects of human-induced climate change might be avoided. Um, 886 gigatons, that's the amount of carbon dioxide that humankind can place in the atmosphere between the year 2000 and mid-century and still have some chance of keeping below the two degree target. We've already used up about one third of this budget. So in the first decade of this century, that leaves us about uh, 565 gigatons to spend by 2050. And the last number there, 2,795 gigatons, that's the carbon potential of proven coal, oil, and gas reserves that are owned by the world's private and public companies <coughs> and governments. So this is the ownership structure for fossil fuels, for our energy, uh, in our, the larger energy infrastructure. So energy, own, energy ownership matters, and again, it's hard to believe that without a lot of social pressure that um, the current energy ownership model is going to willingly move to solar, um, and especially allow smaller players on. And I can talk more about um, the kinds of, of relationships that I've had with the large utility companies with the solar commons. So, um, All right, so, but, so let's just, as a thought experiment, let's just say that uh, we could efficiently add solar using our current investor-owned utility structures. Theoretically, these centralized power systems could simply substitute large-scale solar farms throughout the flat solar-exposed lands in the United States. 
they could transport that electricity across the U.S. landscape into cities. Couldn't solar technology be fit right into the energy system we originally created for the remote coal burning technology of the 20th century? We could have our public utility commissions continue to allow a natural monopoly to these electricity producers, granting them state-supported access to the public right-of-way, guaranteeing the investors to build and update extensive transmission lines here, a good return on their investment through ratepayer hikes that are going to be covering not only the cost of the transmission lines, but also the cost of retiring the coal plants, the oil fields, and the pipelines that are currently in various ways subsidized by the state because they serve the 20th century concept of the public good? Well, there are many problems with trying to fit solar energy into the energy ownership model we created for the last century. I've been talking with a group of farmers in southwestern Minnesota who are not at all happy about the successful integration of solar in the current energy ownership structure. Next Era, uh, has, which is a, uh, a very large multinational company, uh, I mean, works around the globe, it has bought up farmland to put up a 62 megawatt solar power plant um, in southwestern Minnesota with a plan to sell the electricity to XL Energy. The plan, which fits very well into the existing centralized ownership model, does not fit so well into the values that Minnesota's laws have for farmland. It would use 290 acres of prime farmland, which puts it nine times beyond the state limit of how much, uh, let's see, of how much, uh, of how much farmland would be allowed for this kind of uh, energy generation. So again, that this, um, let's see. Sorry, here I lost my place. So um, anyway, I, let's see here. All right, so under the present rules in the state of Minnesota, uh, where this is happening, the state would only allow 31 acres for this project. But as I said, it needs 290 acres. So um, large scale solar farms are competing with farmland in the Midwest, just as they're coming up against environmental impact laws in other states at this large scale. Okay, but even if the 20th century model were sufficient to place solar megawatts on the grid, will it also be producing the diverse kinds of community wealth that these solar panels could deliver? Wealth that goes beyond reducing CO2 emissions and includes benefits for small local businesses and communities, all communities, including low-income neighborhoods. Um, hey, just this is a um, this is a recent symposium at George Washington University about the in including um, solar into the or rather discussing the solar income gap, um, and it's truly a fact that not all communities are accessing the wealth potential of solar energy. This conference um, pre created a, a working paper. Um, and it, which notes that post-2008 solar boom has been very slow to extend to lower income neighborhoods. I'm just going to quote here, the 49 million households that earn less than $40,000 of income per year, they make up 40% of all U.S. households, but only account for less than 5% of solar installations. So access to solar energy could be a source of great economic benefit to low-income communities in the U.S. <coughs> um, I'm going to, uh, I think, just I'm going to um, just read something from that report, and I have it up here. It's the only slide I'm going to read like this, but but just so you can really kind of get the information here. Unlocking solar energy for low-income communities could generate lasting wealth. It could meet a large percentage of their power needs, especially if combined with energy efficiency measures. A four kilowatt distributed PV system generates between 5,000 and 6,500 kilowatt hours of electricity each year, enough to cover more than half of the typical low-income family's needs. If all low-income households went solar, their annual budgets would increase by $17.9 billion and $23.3 billion in income that could be spent on other critical needs, 
of a local businesses uh, rather than just utility bills. So the installation and operation of a full low-income solar build-out would contribute an additional $18.7 billion to local economic output each year, resulting in roughly 138,000 jobs. So that was their finding at this institute about the, um, about the kinds of wealth, the other kinds of wealth that solar can bring to a community. Um, I also want to note here that um, this, this kind of economic value of solar for low-income communities is undisputed. And it's pretty clear right, that without new laws, without government incentives and new financing strategies, <coughs> the old 20th century model will not increase access to solar benefits for these under-resourced communities in the United States. So I'm not going to outline in my talk all the different kinds of support for community solar that currently exists except to say that they now include lots of financing, new kinds of financing options through green banks. There's uh, commercial assessed clean energy programs, PACE programs. We can talk about this later in the question uh, period for businesses and <coughs> low-income neighborhoods. Um, there is, um, and, and all of these things will, can integrate um, solar into existing energy effic in efficiency and energy assistant programs. Um, for example, um, in this model, and we have an example of this with uh, uh, Rio um, uh, uh, in, in, in rural Minnesota, the idea of, of uh, having the um, energy efficiency dollars that come from federal black, uh, block grants <coughs> go directly to um, uh, institutions that are, that are um, you know, have them right now they go directly to utility companies to cover bills for low-income people but if you had a solar commons model for example with that you could have a nonprofit that works in the community be the trustee of the solar and the direct grants the, the money that's you know going throughout this throughout all the states to low-income communities could go directly into solar and then that, those benefits could come directly into the community all right, so um, let me go back um, and say that, how does the solar commons, I'm gonna focus on that, my own research. How does the solar commons contribute to the current picture of community solar in the United States? Well, it really, it does this by innovating community ownership through the legal tool of trust. And I'm gonna, to illustrate this better, I'm gonna take an example from India. Uh, Gram Burvachov, this is a community trust solar project in India, um, it's a social enterprise trust model that brings electricity to very remote parts of India. Just take a minute to kind of explain their model. So they, uh, you see their logo in the center there, they get a funding. They also work with government regulators and in these very remote uh, areas that haven't been electrified yet, they're gonna work with, uh, with the village um, tra they do training uh, for systems operator in the village and they have the village become the owners through a trust arrangement of the photovoltaic system. Uh, in, importantly, one thing that they do is that in order to get that technology, the village has to agree that the trustees that are going to be governing this, that come from the village, have to include half women and half men. So in this way, they're actually building, by using this trust model, they're building gender equity and helping to create social change in the community. Um, we can talk more about uh, women's role in, in, uh, you know, in um, managing the system and things like that in India, but I just wanted to note that this, uh, that this model that uses trust is very unique. It's been very successful there in these villages, in fact, um, we're having, hopefully soon, some of the trust documents, because they're written in the languages of the villages themselves, we're gonna have them translated into English so that we can compare uh, the community trust models that we're trying to write here in the United States, which we don't have any yet, successful ones yet. All right, here's the common Solar Commons trust ownership structure. You get a, do a donation from uh, a, a foundation, a nonprofit, um, it goes into uh, the trust, it, it purchases the trust um, assets, the solar, solar voltaic 
um, hardware, and it also uh, um, has the, the trustee owning the contract to sell that electricity to an adjacent mm -hmm. user. In Arizona, uh, we built, uh, there's a, a nonprofit organization called Clean Energy Corporation that is going to be the trustee uh, for the solar commons. And then our beneficiary is going to be a, a land, urban land trust um, in, the, in, in Tempe, where we're building the first one. So the, um, uh, again, what's really important is that the trustee could be any kind of nonprofit entity. Uh, it's this, it could be. It could even be a church. It could be a. Um, it could be a land trust. And I'm. I'm really interested in, in working specifically with land trust. But when I presented this to the uh, uh, Green Bill to the USGBC Council, uh, the audience said, "Why couldn't all of our um, USGBC chapters around the United States be trustees for solar commons?" And Indeed, they could. You can take this model and, and kind of place this kind of trustee ownership, community trust ownership, into existing infrastructures across the country that exist for, um, that have an interest in solar energy. Okay, for those of you who aren't familiar with the land trust model, um, this idea of dual ownership, uh, it comes, has a very long history in the United States. It comes from, it, it, the way it works is that uh, the community land trust owns, and now this is not for solar, but this is the history of land trust in the United States and why I use this model, I'll explain in a minute, but so the community land trust owns the land and then a small business or a cooperative can own the building that's on that land and lease, have a lease, um, or an individual home could own uh, a house on community trust land. And the community trust keeps the property values uh, down, or rather captures that extra wealth in the community as the <coughs> property values go up, and it keeps it affordable, so you can have affordable housing um, in cities. But this model of trust ownership, you probably recognize, is also used for land conservation. Land trusts hold conservation easements in all kinds of lands around, especially around areas where they're trying to protect water and other things. There are they can hold land specifically for uh, agriculture. Um, they can hold land in commercial spaces. And again, there's a very, very long history uh, in the 20th century of the uh, community land trust movement. And um, the question for me is, that we are working on legally, is adapting this movement for solar. It's, um, very, it, that has really just grown in the United States since the 1980s. Okay, um, just a little bit about the community, um, the solar commons. Um, model here was, here's a design that uh, an architect created for a, uh, to put the solar commons in right of way. They could kind of run down an urban freeway system or something like that. So um, this is one, one of the models we had. Um, the other one, we have the, one of the first ones was also um, on in light rails on in shade structures on uh, in light rail corridors again owned by a local uh, nonprofit and bringing that selling electricity to low income areas and bringing those benefits back localizing them into the community. As I said, um, public art is always a part of the Solar Commons project. Uh, we designed the solar commons to have public art that can act as a landmark for an emergent energy infrastructure that's shaped to fit nature rather than the other way around. Our plan with the solar commons, um, we have this idea that each will have a kind of distinctive whirly gig that turns in response to the forces of nature. A whirly gig, which is a beautiful piece of American folk art. Um, it could even be built into a kit uh, that would be then given to local school children who would improvise their own flourishing uh, bits as they kind of learn to care about the relationship between the natural world and the U.S. electricity sector. So, so public art with the solar commons technology can help embed our energy system in our care for our common home. Right now, the project is being tested. Um, I've raised the money for to build the first demonstration project in Arizona. I'm working with faculty at the uh, U of M 
law school's um, energy transition lab uh, were to innovate the classic land trust deed for solar commons here, um, and working with people at ASU in the law school there to innovate it for uh, Arizona. Um, it was you know a long process of building the relationships with the nonprofits that could then become the trustees. Certainly working with cities and various others, and again I can talk much more about that. Uh, the actual. Uh, uh, work to build the project, this demonstration project. The way I've been working with this as my own action research project is that I, I took these design principles of commons building and applied them to solar energy and uh, I build, uh, so I have a design and then I create a demonstration project or a protocol in a place with a neighborhood, with a community, raise the money for it and then we try to figure out uh, in building it, exactly what do we need, what's gonna, what is needed here, and we then tweak the design from that. So we have one in, in Arizona that's going on. The laws for community solar are very different there. Access to the grid is different. Uh, utility structures are different, and certainly the general public's um, attitude about rooftop and community solar is different. Um, here in Minnesota, Again, you, we need a, demonstra a demonstration project that we're starting to gather partners for to test the protocol and, and do that here. So again, we can talk more about that um, in the question and answer section. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna close here so that we have plenty of time to talk. Um, what do solar commons tell us about community solar? They're meant to remind us that photovoltaic solar is not just a technology. It's a socio-technical system that's connected to values, norms, institutions, and social disparities. Understood in this broader way then, we're better situated to see the multiple benefits that solar has to offer us today when it's owned by communities. <coughs> My argument in this talk was that we need community solar because it has the potential to deliver multiple benefits to society. Benefits that belong to every rate payer whose right of way is used to carry electricity across the land. So I'm going to just end by summarizing here um, and referring to uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian of American technology, Thomas Hughes who in his famous study, Networks of Power, uh, demonstrated that power systems are what he calls cultural artifacts. <coughs> they are, he wrote, I quote, the physical, intellectual, and symbolic resources of the society that constructs them. So I would add that electric grids are a form of public history. They're stationed in our public right of way. And they tell a story about how we share and govern our natural resources. <coughs> and they tell a story of how we use the intellectual resources of our scientists, engineers, and technicians. The power lines, substations, and the solar energy panels that we see around us are symbolic resources too. And that's why the Solar Commons aims to create a new physical, economic, and cultural story about the community power of electricity in the 21st century. So thank you very much, um, and I'd be happy to take questions.
percent from here. So uh, some of the folks who are working on the on the spartans will be here and have the clock further. That is so exciting. Can I ask you a question? Is it a solar gardens model? Is that what yes. you're using? Yes. So you have, an, I imagine people are familiar with that. You have a subscription. Uh, um, owners can have a subscription. So small scale owners can have a subscription to a uh, to a panel, and maybe and, and and then they become the owners in a sense of the system. It's a mixed model. There'll be owners, so upfront payment owners, but also pay okay. as you go. Monthly payments, um, which um, so they're outside financiers. Okay, so you do have that. that part of it. And what's the ownership structure besides the subs besides the um, subscribers, the subscription? I mean, um, are the outside investors then will they once they capture their investment, will they turn it over to uh, the ownership of, say, the church, so that it can capture the rest of that? Wealth that's coming uh, I, in I, as an income stream. No, I believe I believe the outside investors will remain. They remain the owners. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> right. So this is really important. I, this the solar gardens model, which is here in Minnesota now, thanks to Interfaith Power and Lights, amazing work for the last few years in this, um, really changing this the landscape here in Minnesota for that. Um, but the solar commons model, and I'm working with people up in Duluth. That are from Interfaith Power and Light to see if this so how we would work with Solar Commons model with uh, you know what they're doing there with the churches, yeah. But our model that Solar Commons would have community trust ownership, and if there are investors in, involved, they would after a certain amount of time they would turn the um, ownership structure back to a community ownership. Catherine, thanks a lot. Hi. Great talk. So, would you talk a little bit to us about how the kind of public art aspect of this work has mattered? Would you elaborate on that a little bit more? I think, especially for an audience with a certain number of natural scientists sitting in it, it would be very interesting to hear a little reflection on, you know, what difference it made. Yeah. Well, so community solar. Where is the community in community solar? You know. And so, if I'm putting photovoltaics up on a church or a building or something, they, they just fit into the kind of symbolic statement that the energy system is making. And we're not really using the potential of our public space to point to what's happening that's different here and to point to a different relationship. That's what we want to do with this public, uh, the public space that's being used by uh, solar panels. Now, um, even at the utility scale, there's some really interesting designs that use art, public art, in energy, in, in solar <coughs> infrastructure that are being designed around the country. Uh, the University of, uh, of New York in Buffalo has an amazing new design on their campus. Uh, uh, you know, uh, people in, in um, some architects in Denmark have some very interesting structures for the large utility scale ones. We're starting to do that. Um, to use this and to understand that we need to symbolically demonstrate what is different. And uh, in my project, uh, you know, I really want to, as community solar, I want to make the, have the community be part of the producers of the art as well. So they'll work with the artists, the public artists, they'll work with um, hopefully we'll be working with some with schools around where the solar commons is have kids if we have a whirly gig that's what we're thinking right now uh, lots of little parts for it maybe they can be created by the kids in the school um, and then you know attached to the whirly gig uh, but that they will have an ownership stake in it in several ways as well as a, as the environmental education piece that goes with it so we're really going to you know understand that our electrical grid landscape and the new solar we're putting on is a kind of public history. And it is really, we're trying to use its symbolic uh, capacity to show us you know, something new about our relationship to the earth and to energy. Does that answer the question? Have you looked into Parking lots. We have so many parking lots all over the country. It yeah. seems to me that the best empty space 
capture so much sun, so, so much power. Absolutely. You know, I just, landfills, you know, um, lots of spaces, not prime farmland, but parking lots, landfills, and these other places where you can produce several kinds of benefits besides solar electricity. In Arizona, we always want to produce shade whenever we can with solar, right? Why let that opportunity go? So if we put solar in our solar commons, we have it, if it's in a park, it produces a shade structure. Then we also have a possibility for the environmental education piece, for the art piece, for several things, for a gathering place, um, using solar for that. But yes, all of these surface areas, uh, I think. And I think the question is, you know, how, if they're community solar, the benefits um, that you were talking about, for example, with interfaith power and light that, and we're really starting to do with community solar, build training for people in the neighborhood, you know, to be, to, for job training for this, have them working on it, on um, the solar installations as well. Um, and, uh, you know, any ways that you use local materials, um, things like that. There's several <coughs> ways in which you can take, you know, the landscape as it exists with parking lots and other surfaces and really start to work with it differently in your design. Hi. Um, so, a lot of you that, you, when you said, talking about the trustees, you said that they were typically nonprofits. Um, which makes sense. Um, however, there are a number of corporations, um, Patagonia is just one example, but plenty of others that have a strong sustainability focus and a strong social good focus as well. And I'm wondering if there is some reason why they can't also kind of be trustees or what it is about corporations that would make them perhaps bad trustees. Um, so That's a great idea. Um, I think that certainly a, a for-profit could have a uh, be a trust. I don't know. They could they be a trustee. I've never actually thought about how they would be a trustee for a community solar project. Why not? You know, why not? They have. So, what is it about trust ownership that makes it different than a uh, general contract ownership? Here, my my lawyer here can also talk about this too. But it 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 really is the higher obligation that goes with it. You are you're obliged as a trustee to deliver something to your beneficial owner, right? And, and one of the important things about trust is, and why Eleanor Ostrom and, and many other environmental lawyers are starting to use trust legal strategies now um, is because of this higher level of obligation that it gives to the owner. So for example, uh, um, in, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the work of Mary Woods, um, in Oregon. Uh, um, she has a book called Nature's Trust. And she's running this project right now across the country called the Children's Trust Project where children, kids, anyone under 18 sues in their state, because the laws are state by state, they sue the state government for not protecting the rights of future generations by not having sufficient um, um, caps to uh, and, and um, energy efficient um, uh, carbon uh, carbon emission plants, so they're suing under the public trust doctrine. They're saying that you, the state, are a trustee of the atmosphere, the atmosphere of commons, and as a trustee, you are obliged to keep it for the beneficial owner. Who's the beneficial owner of the atmosphere? Future generations, present and future generations, and let's throw in a few other non-human creatures there too. Right. So, the thing about the trust, which is, and I, I'm writing something right now that looks historically at this, but it's, I'm kind of a geek for this kind of thing. But you know, trust law comes from the English common law tradition of equity law. Equity law is where, when your common law tradition didn't provide a solution for you, you just made a, a special plea to the king for equity in the situation. So equity courts are for when your laws aren't really working for it. But the, the why is trust an equity law solution? It, it arose in uh, during the Crusades when soldiers who were away from land needed to have somebody hold land on their behalf. It was a way of holding something or owning something for those who were not present on the land. Well, we really need 
ways of holding things for future generations and others who are not present or can't be present because they don't have a political voice to speak. So trust ownership and the evolution of it uh, in the work of, of using the public trust doctrine in the United States, but also the way Ellen, Eleanor Olstrom uh, you know, encouraged us to do is to innovate with trust ownership, which is exactly what I'm trying to do with the Solar Commons model. It is an innovation that we need to keep doing with trust ownership, building in with this, this remnant we have of this equity law system that may allow us to uh, hold something for others who are not present. I want to get into my head uh, a couple of those numbers you mentioned. So you mentioned something like 290 acres, and how many megawatts was that? 62. 62 megawatts. Okay, that's quite a few thousand households. Yes, yes, it is. Now, so the other thing then is, if those are, so one of the ways you mentioned that, not just waste land, but you could, I suppose, it would take a little bit of psychological getting used to it. But you know, many forests have an upper story and an understory. It's a vibrant understory in many forests with a plant and animal community. And the upper story is things like maple, basswood, and so on. The lower story are things like ironwoods and so on. But under solar cells, you can make a perfectly good understory with ironwoods and all that in that whole community. And you can have a working, functioning ecosystem. It's just that you've sacrificed the high upper story. But you know, you can make a fairly good ecosystem that way. I suppose with solar cells above, it would take psychologically getting used to it. Wow, how interesting. Do you know of anybody who's doing that, or is that just a concept? Right? No, I just thought of it when we were talking about this. Oh. <laughs> I just, I want to note that forests, you know, um, I presented the Solar Commons plan to Eleanor Olstrom's workshop, which you, uh, um, um, and, and the person that was there with me was working on forests as commons. And we were, you know, looking both at this at trust law and how trust works. But forests are so interesting because even trees in a city, um, there are, we have many friends of the parks and various other organizations who really are community organizations that are caring for these things and the, the, the trees and the forests. And so there's a very interesting kind of possibility here for community stewardship. Um, community ownership, uh, obligating the community to that. Uh, we already have some structures for that with forests and others, and we're really looking for the ways in which, uh, you know, again, Ostrom's idea of subsidiarity, which is you try to govern at the, small, at the most local level possible, because you can build tr actual trust in face-to-face -face situations. So in forests, and for, for larger forests with the DNR, with uh, in small, even in urban parks and things like that, um, what's the new technology that would allow us to use solar in these places? What are the community um, structures uh, that uh, could care for that technology and uh, that stewardship? It's interesting. So on my question that's coming here from the uh, Excel has been using legal roadblocks to delay community solar in Minnesota. Delay could mean death, as they know, because their opinion is the question, uh, because the federal tax incentives needing a raise to be built by the end of 2016. Any insights how we overcome this? It's a disaster if we lose those federal 30% uh, federal tax incentive. It's a disaster for community solar. It's a disaster for solar, I would say. Um, so how do we prevent that? I mean, I think there has to be political action for that. And uh, yes, it's not in the interests of the large-scale utilities to have smaller community of solar. Or, uh, and, and you know, it's um, this next era project I told you about. Um, I understand, having interviewed several people here that are working in the energy field in, in Minnesota, that they are proposed several large solar farms like that throughout Minnesota. Um, they are going to the PUC to ask for a variance on our laws for using prime farmland. Um, they do have, I understand, a uh, contracts kind of in the pipeline with Excel 
to sell that energy directly to XL. They're putting the, those solar farms closer, close to some kind of substation so they can go right into the grid. Will they need to, will XL need to do anything with, sol with community solar? Will they be incentivized to do anything with it if they're already taking care of that with these very large systems? Um, I don't know what will happen to community solar if we're not able to have some of these important incentives and other things that, uh, that allow us to work in this way. Um. So I'm wondering about the potential for community ownership of other types of renewable energy. I mean, you know, so solar in Arizona makes a lot of sense and maybe not quite as much sense in some parts of Minnesota or the north, and so you know, wind comes to mind immediately. Yeah. Um, and if you've explored the potential for community ownership of that, or why sort of solar lends itself over others, or what have you. Yeah, I started the you know, with solar just because I was in Arizona, and I I I worked on uh, kind of commons governance issues, and I just thought, you know, what is what are the commons in Arizona, you know? And tried to kind of look around me, and I thought about right of way, you know, could that be a kind of residual form of the kind of pre-modern, non-modern commons ownership stuff, right of way that kind of goes through all kinds of property, state property, private property. Right of way is a really interesting kind of residual, non-modern uh, commons. So I tried to start working with that, and of course, the sun shines for everyone. So the wind blows for everyone. Wherever you are, I think that this kind of, this innovation with the community land trust model which is what I'm doing, can be done for all kinds of renewable energy. Why not? Uh, multiple kinds. So you could have a community land trust that is doing a solar commons, wind commons, and several things with a smart grid, and they're actually able to, uh, you know, control, uh, you know, you know so the, the variations between the two. Uh, would be wonderful. Capture all the benefits. I, right now I'm taking a class here, it's a climate change and energy law and policy class with Melissa Portman and Melvin <coughs> Anderson, who are legislators who have, you know, been like devoting basically their careers to renewable energy standards and um, Melissa Portman just wrote our lecture yesterday was on her solar um, policies and the 2013 clean energy summary. Um, have you worked with those two legislators at all? Because right here, you know, our handout said, XL is required to offer a community solar garden program. I mean, is this something you're already familiar with? Are you working with? Yeah, thank you for the question. more of the community and aspect into, and the commons aspect, in, even into the laws. Absolutely, in fact, thank you for the opportunity to say that yes, I'm, I'm working with Ellen Anderson and with the uh, Energy Transition Lab. And uh, absolutely, uh, we're, we're uh, doing a study on how so at solar access for low-income communities and the solar commons model is one that we're looking at alongside solar gardens and various other models. So uh, absolutely, and those, you know, Ellen's work and other, uh, others work on, uh, you know, on solar legislation uh, that have been so important here in this state, uh, just, can't use enough repeating. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. And we're just about out of time here, and I wanted to hear Catherine the last word of the day. So Catherine, what's next? Where is this all headed? What's next for you in terms of the work that you're doing? So I want to see solar commons demonstration projects in every state, a couple. Um, I want to see non different kinds of nonprofits innovating as trustees, becoming trustees. Um, Community Land Trust in Arizona I was working with when I first went to them and said, could you be a trustee for a solar? You know how to do trust. You know how to hold conservation trust easements. You know how to do be a trustee. And uh, you know, they were like, oh no, no, we only do this kind of trust. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to think about expanding. I would like to see, you know, expansion of the community land trust model for solar, and I'm having a really wonderful reception with some community land trusts here in Minnesota, I'm so happy to say. What do I want? I want to see it tested. It needs to be tested differently in every state because the state laws are different. And uh, what new legislation do we need to really enable this? That's what Ellen and others are trying to figure out. Um, what kind of, uh, you know, how, how can nonprofits themselves 
what, are, what kind of obligation responsibility does it mean to be a trustee for solar? Uh, we have to you know, create those trust deeds and really get a good look at that. Let's look at what they've done in India. Let's look at some of the other places that use common law uh, traditions like our own and see uh, what trust, the possibility for trust, which is holding property for those who are not there. You know, Let's see what we can do with that model uh, to capture greater common uh, resource benefits for communities. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our speaker for the